Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. I am your host, Gabriel Garcia, always known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. And welcome to another historian's interview. Now, my guest today is a full-time government consultant, but is also a history nerd. He lives in Vienna, Virginia with his daughter and fiance, whom he regularly tortures with the double whammy of dad jokes and history jokes. He is the son of a history teacher, big surprise, and is originally from New York. He is also a West Point graduate and Army veteran who served in Iraq as a tank platoon leader. However, he doesn't just like war books. His favorite history subjects are the American Revolution, shipwrecks, and voyages of discovery, although you can probably talk him into anything once. And he is also the host of his very own podcast as well. And to tell us more about that and his love for history, Let's give a huge round of applause and big welcome to the gay's guest, Brendan. Brendan, thank you so much for joining us today. Gabriel, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. We are lucky to have you today, Brendan. So before we dive into the questions, is there anything more you'd like to add about uh, your background? Uh, I think we covered all of the main stuff. I'm just excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. So let's just jump right into it. So... What would you say is your aha moment that really got you into loving history? I, when I was growing up, my mother was a history teacher, as we said in my bio. So I always heard the coolest stuff about history. My mother was really adept at being able to take those little tidbits that make you interested. So when I was growing up, every day I'd wake up and I'd come downstairs and mom would be there reading a book and my dad was also the type that had all of those little tidbits. So I grew up just around history and being interested in those things. Um, as far as an aha moment for history and what kind of led me to the podcast and the blog, I like these types of books that don't get a lot of Amazon reviews. And I got really mad looking at a book. It was amazing. I loved it. I looked at the reviews. I said, why is it so low? And there was just all these reviews about how the Kindle was missing a page, one star. Ooh. And that's when I looked at it. I said, there, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I said, well, you know, I'll just start my own blog. And I was talking with a friend of mine at work, and he's a web developer on the side. And I just told him my idea. He said, let's sketch it out. This, this sounds like something. Let's sketch it out. And of course, you know, I, I just thought, I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe five people will read it. Maybe six people i'll meet made some new history friends and we'll go from there and then now it's a podcast and a blog and everything else so a lot of aha moments along the way and then you know you know when you do this type of things one day you look in the mirror and you go whoa i've done a yeah that is very very true and speaking on your podcast so when you decided to create this what was the initial desire you want to satisfy for your listeners as well as a promise you're making to them as well as those who read your blog i just wanted to introduce people to history in a way that didn't feel like you were back in high school taking a history course there was so many great books that are history that people are not going to touch because they're history so right. what i wanted to do was present those books in a way so that people went oh wait um that's the story that, that's the story I'm going to hear. I, I always find it, it's, it's, listen, I love TV. I, I do love fiction. But when it comes to reading nonfiction, you're just, you're learning and you're reading a great story when it's done well. Um, so my promise to the readers is, first of all, I'm going to be honest. It, uh, if I read a book and I don't like it, I'm generally not going to, you know, run out there and tell everybody it's the worst book on earth. But if it's a great book, I'm going to make sure everybody hears about it. So I'm going to be honest, I've read the book, that, that's another one which I find that authors really appreciate, especially before mm -hmm. interviews. I start off by saying, um, I read your book beginning to end, and it's, it's immediately an icebreaker because authors really appreciate it. So, you know, the entire intent is just take these stories that might get ignored because of their label and present it to people in a way that makes them say, I'll give it a shot. Perfectly spoken and perfectly said. And speaking again of your podcast, what was probably your favorite episode as of right now that's probably your favorite to discuss? 
That that one is so hard. I remember looking at the questions, like I'm like, I don't have a really good answer for it to say that one, because I've talked to every person that I've talked to. I've now talked to about 120 authors and podcasters. Wow. And everyone has been at the very least very nice. Um, if not, I, I have met now authors, I've met them, you know, out for drinks and things like that. I met one of them in Iceland, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it, it's hard. I would say the one that really blew my mind was, well, there's two. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say two. Um, James M. Scott, he's a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He was the second person I interviewed, and I, I always tell everybody he's kind of the reason the podcast even exists. What I was going to do is keep everything on the blog. I was going to interview authors and just have it transcribed onto the blog and interviewed James. And it went really well. And he said, you're going to make this podcast, right? I said, oh, no, like that. That's all this stuff that I don't know how to do. And he said, no, you you need to make this podcast like this needs to be a thing. Ooh, you need okay. to do it. And I lucked out that my best friend uh, was a music major. Um, plays in bands and is just an absolute master when it comes to sound stuff. And he said, if you record it, I'll make it sound good. And I said, nice. all right, as long as I don't have to edit myself, because I will <laughs> tell you, editing is the worst part. And I don't want to hear my voice that much, as much as my fiance says otherwise. Um, and so that was a big one where I'm talking to somebody who was a Pulitzer Prize finalist telling me you should do this. And then a few months later, I remember Debbie Applegate was the first Pulitzer Prize winner that we interviewed. And I remember being nervous a little bit and then getting on the phone. And if you hear that conversation, it was the easiest conversation ever. Debbie's just a dynamo. She is just amazingly kind. And, you know, it was so easy to talk to. And that's when I kind of sat there and I said, okay, I, I can I can talk with anybody. As long as I read the book and I know what I'm talking about, I can talk with anybody because that was very nerve wracking. And then you got on and it's just like anything else. They're just somebody who wants to talk about their book. And they love that chance to be able to get in there and try and bring it to people. So I always say, uh, I just get the authors on and I don't get in their way. Nice. Actually, that's a very same mindset for me when I interview um, my authors on my show. Very much the same thing. And plus, it allows them a platform to talk about their book to a digital um, audience, which is incredible, and gain the feedback from them, which is great. And speak on the lines of feedback, uh, Brendan. When you created your very first episode, what was the initial response like from friends and family as well as people who were eager to see the very first episode or at least listen to the first episode? It was really positive uh, and i really appreciated it is because i i think there's the step between an idea and actually doing it, it is a huge step for anybody and we had to there was a few episodes that we tried to do as our first episode that did not work at all and luckily mike my producer slash editor and all that stuff my partner in this we did a couple episodes let our loved ones listen to it and they said don't do this. This is this is not going to work. Mm, um, okay. And we pride ourselves having people around us that are going to tell us the truth. And we heard it and we said, this is good feedback. And I had just interviewed Kate Moore, an amazing author, just a wonderful person, interviewed her. And I just said, I think this is just episode one. Like, let's just keep it simple. We had a great author, great conversation. Her book is fantastic this is it. And then we put that out and we got great feedback and then we're off to the races. Awesome. And now looking back from that first episode and now where you're at right now with all the authors you've interviewed, do you feel that your promise has been honored? It's been validated? I think so. I, especially when you get the feedback of somebody said, oh, and I'm sure you've gotten it too. I heard about this book on your episode and I went out and bought it and I loved it that that is the best feeling in the world um, because it's not even you know I don't even think it's my promise this is just hey get these people on there so they can get their voices a little bit louder in, in places like that we had one author this was about six months ago so we, we were already doing it for about a year and a half um, but we did the episode 
went really well. And then just a couple of weeks later, he reached out and just said, hey, like, really appreciate you doing this because for nonfiction authors, especially history authors, mm -hmm. getting books out there is hard. It's yes. very, very hard. And getting a physical book made is, is even harder. Mm -hmm. And he reached out and just said, I really appreciate it because we need people like you doing this to help amplify what we're trying to do. And that was kind of, I didn't know we really had a mission statement until we got that email. And I said, oh, that's really what we're doing. You know, I was having fun and just letting authors talk. Right. But it, it went from just fun to, oh, it, this is a little bit important. We, we can mm -hmm. sit back and say, this is actually important what we're doing because it, it's appreciated by the guests, which is fantastic. Right. And I 100% I agree. And especially... Anyone that comes on a podcast, there is a sense of like, you know, nervousness of like the guests, like running, I don't know what to expect, but it's always a refreshing, like after the end of any interview, when the guest is like impressed, like saying this was actually really well done, very professional, it makes them feel at ease. And also for the host as well, I'm sure you agree, Brandon, that when starting a podcast, there is that sort of sense of imposter syndrome when it's like, I'm interviewing all these people. I'm presenting my content on the world stage. I don't know if I'm going to get the audience that I want or get my message across. And that can kind of be deflating. But for you, Brennan, in your opinion, what has continued to discipline you to creating your content to keep interviewing these authors and allowing them a platform to present their work to a new variety of readers and future audience members the main thing is I, i'm a voracious reader no matter what um i'm i'm lucky in that i can read pretty fast and still kind of take everything in and i'm gonna read no matter what's going on if somebody calls me tomorrow and says you can no longer do the podcast you can no longer do the blog i'm still reading so that that drive that discipline just comes from the fact that i finish a book and i went i gotta talk to this person i i, I want to make sure that you know, we don't know, like sometimes your reach isn't as long as you want, but it's mm -hmm. if it's just five or six more people. You want that many more people to hear about these books, to be able to right. enjoy it as much as you do. But I, and you mentioned it, that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm always nervous right before that interview, but I don't I, I don't know if you're the same way. Always nervous right before get into it get comfortable real quick and then at the end of it i'm like i can go run 10 miles right now i'm just so energized by that same 100 percent. and there is like i remember when i first started my own show i didn't know what to expect it was initially just indie authors on anchor my youtube was only just now a year old it's very very recent but as i came into my own and really started honing my craft of like, okay, getting these right questions, sending it out ahead of time so the audience or the guest is not surprised by the questions. That set the tone and then figuring out, okay, what am I going to be? What's my name and everything? All of that I've grown as a person creating the Wandering Tribe and its uh, brother, the Wandering Quill. All of that has really helped mold me, especially how like, I talk with people, like the questions, how I approach guests and everything, and learning so much from them, especially when it comes to history. I love interviewing um, historians, history buffs, fellow history content creators, because I learn so much. And especially when we talk about history, we always get a chance to see, you know, who really molded us into the orders of history that we are now. So for you, Brendan, who else would you say have been like role models in your presentation of history? I have to say, I, it's very funny. When I listen to other podcasts, I generally listen to comedy podcasts because I'm usually doing something at the same time. So if I'm listening to a history podcast, I want to be laser focused. Right. Um, so when I listen to a lot of podcasts, whether, you know, working out, doing stuff around the house, uh, I'm usually listening to history podcasts. And the first podcast that really got me in was uh, Mark Maron's podcast, WTF. And mm. I really like that he got on there and just kind of let people talk. And he took it in the direction that the guests wanted them to go. And then I just kind of built out from there. Um, Michael Rosenbaum's 
podcast where you know he talks about yes. mental health. I I love that one. Um, inside of you, I, it's just mm. it's great because he's another guy kind of get out of the way of the guests, let the guests shine and things like that. And I'm also passionate about mental health and everything like that. Um, but you know, it's a lot of different, anybody who does just a good interview where you can tell that they know they're not the star. It's the person right. getting interviewed is the star. Um, except in this episode right here, you're still the star. <laughs> 100%. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's very important for especially history podcast, especially if you have like a guest on like the show and they're like either talking about like a book or like a topic, allow them to shine too. I mean, yes, it is your show, but you brought them on. So allow them to shine. Also allow them to engage in discussions with you because that's always fun. I always love discussions with fellow history enthusiasts. That's why I have my own series, the Historians Lounge, where me and historians of every kind, be it student, reenactor, professor, academic, author, etc., we just talk about history. In fact, one of my longest episodes to date is me talking with um, Professor uh, Neil, Neil Chatelain, and we talked about um, post-Civil War Confederate Navy. And what happened to the men who served in the Confederate Navy? Where do they go? Some served in South America. Some went to um, Asia. Some went to North Africa and Egypt. And how they helped modernize those countries and empires and navies. I mean, it's so fascinating. It's really, really enjoyable when it comes to studying history. And as you said too, Brandon, letting the guest shine is important too. Which then kind of leads into another um discussion and this is now more of on the business side of the podcast so when you created the podcast did you have an ideal um audience in mind or a type of listener in mind because i definitely feel either if you're an author a podcaster youtuber or any form of content creator knowing your audience is crucial and critical and I definitely feel that's an aspect that not a lot of people take into consideration. So, Brendan, for you, how important is it to understand um, your audience? And when you were making your podcast, did you have an idea of what you wanted your audience to be? Or do you create your content for a broad audience? And if people listen to them from varying backgrounds, then that's okay. When we first started, the thought in my head was I wanted to be somewhere in between somebody who will never, ever read history, no matter what's going on, and scholars. I wanted to get everyone in between, either those people that are just kind of into history, people who might be willing if the story is good enough. And that's what we thought it was, you know, a very large subset of people, right? Right. Um and that was the main focus. And now I think we've gone a little bit broader just because when we started, it was, you know, very much history, history. But now, you know, we'll do a little bit more science-based episodes and things like that. Um, and the the audience hasn't changed too much, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But luckily, it's gotten a little bit bigger, which, which helps a lot um, to kind of keep going when you know that there is there's more people to kind of pull in the longer you do right this thing. definitely and also still on the lines of like the business side and i'm sure you agree brendan when it comes to like social media history is blown up everywhere instagram facebook twitter linkedin there's a lot of history sites and that's always good but even with like with anything especially with social media there is the chance of you know misinformation or talking about history that's not um accurate and even sometimes when like media like movie or tv have made like docudramas of like the newest thing and more recently like cleopatra or even like alexander the great everyone's talking about it. everyone's breaking it down and you want to make videos on those topics and i had a guest uh past guest talk about how it's important to have those discussions on those similar uh, themes or clicks that are happening in the digital world, but you don't want to make content surely just for content because your audience is going to recognize that's not your best work. That's not your authentic you. 
you just made it to um, just be part of the trend. So, Brendan, in your opinion, like, how is it important as a historian and content creator to, like, find the balance between being part of the discussion but also being truthful to the presentation of history, no matter what uh, topic it may be? I, I'd rather be wrong than to put anything. I, I would rather no one listen to me than to put out something that's wrong. I think that that should be paramount, especially when you're dealing with something like history. There's there's things that we don't know and you mm -hmm. have to make guesses at. And a good historian will always point out that, hey, this sounds like a great story and I can't tell you it didn't happen, but probably didn't. At the same time, I see exactly what you're talking about, Gabriel. It's I'm reading and you see it and you say, that's not, that's an old wives tale thing used to say, that's just not true. Right. And social media, it's very hard because mm -hmm. you don't want to go out there and start, you know, fights with people online. Right. It will take over your whole life. Right. But until you're doing this, you also don't realize. Um, so social media, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I put up book reviews or like history TV reviews. Tuesday and Thursday, I go out and I just find some content to put up right now. On Tuesdays, I put up old timey words that I want to bring back. And on Thursday, I just try and do kind of a meme with a history fact in there. Mm. And reading the book, writing the review, easy. Trying to go out there and find history facts that are interesting and that you know are absolutely 100% true. Uh, I've lost hours putting together yes. a meme or something like that. And you sit there and I just keep digging, just keep double checking. You go, oh, wait, this is a reliable source and it says this didn't happen. And now it's like, now you got to go look for three or four others. You, you could lose your whole day with it. But I think it's right. It's so important to do that, right? If you're going to write fiction, have fun. You can do whatever you want when you're doing nonfiction. There is that extra part where you have to be sure. And I mean, that's why I, I'm so in awe by these authors, because as we mm -hmm. talked about, they're experts on what they've written. And right they've read they've read at least 40 or 50 books just to put their one book together mm -hmm. and you don't realize how hard that is until you try and do some sort of right something and you're like oh i'm six resources deep and i have no idea what the truth is just yet definitely and that's another thing too a little side tangent uh listeners when writing a nonfiction book it's not easy you may have to do probably 50 primary sources maybe even double your secondary sources. And that's just for one book because you need to get every perspective, every angle, and you may miss a few things, but you definitely want to be a hundred percent sure you got all the information correct and you can back it up with your sources. It is not easy. It is a challenge. It is a nightmare. Writing a book in general is a nightmare because it's long hours you're spending hours editing, hours revising. It's a very lonely process, and we get into that sense of imposter syndrome. It's the same thing with creating content videos on YouTube or on a podcast platform. It's You never know how long something is until you've actually been in it yourself. And I've learned so much about being a podcaster from a lot of friends who've molded me, gave me the ropes, told me the uh, resources to use, which I now want to um, ask you, uh, Brennan, is there any shout outs you want to give to those who have helped you sort of come into your own as a podcaster and a content creator in terms of like, how do you present the episodes? How do you market the episodes? How do you, you know, speak when speaking to a guest on this topic or talking about, as you said, the reviews of TV shows and movies. So who would you say have really helped you come into your own for this podcast? I'd say the first other podcaster and one of your previous guests, TK for the love of history, she was the first other podcaster I talked to. And she helped so much in just kind of understanding. I think she was probably about a year ahead of me starting everything. Right. And you know, talking about lonely, that first, you know, six, nine months when you're putting this stuff up and you're like, I'm yelling into the void. I'm talking to myself mm -hmm. and talking to TK. She had started really getting her footing and just, you know, 
being vulnerable and saying, hey, I think I'm terrible at this. I think I'm, I'm not doing this right. And she was so encouraging about this is where I was and this is the things I had to do. And this is what it looked like at this point. But then this happened and things started really, you know, exploding for her. Uh, and she was a great resource. Another is Laurel from Hightailing Through History. Mm, uh, okay. She was my second podcaster that I interviewed. And such a nice person. Like, we're still messaging once, at least once or twice a week. I did an episode on theirs. She came on mine. And she's also just encouragement. Because that's what you need as a podcaster is... Even if you have all those numbers, it, you want somebody you can say, like, am I doing this right? Like, does this make sense? Right. And, and it's just so important to be able to do that. And I've talked to some other podcasters. I, I'd go down the list. But uh, other podcasters just being vulnerable and every single one of them has been willing to say, like, I've, I've had those same thoughts. And I've worried about those same things. Mm-hmm. And I think the most important thing I learned is your audience is a finite size and right history is not going to be the same as if you're doing pop culture and you're talking mm-hmm. about a, a, a tv show so be comfortable with that if you get 10 people who are really passionate about listening to what you're doing you're doing great because i mean if you put those 10 people in a room and said these people love to hear what you're putting out that's awesome like that's just super cool that is really really like truly Exactly what I've always said. And even if you have like a small audience that are loyal, that enjoy what you're doing, then that's all that matters. You could have a large audience. And sometimes that large audience is like a huge fan base, which is always good. And in some cases, you may have a large audience, but only, as you said, like maybe 10 or maybe even 20 people will actually follow you and ask, when's the next episode coming about? It's always important to have that which then leads into the next question uh last of the business one so whenever you're making uh content brendan do you make content in the sense that you wish that you had learned this subject or heard about this book uh growing up or do you make it for as you said before the person who has never learned about history all the way up to an academic who has spent their entire life studying this one particular topic of history? I like to think of myself as a hype man for the book. And what I'm doing is give the basics, but also the coolest parts of the book. So right. that, with, without giving it away, right? Because I'll also talk to true crime authors. You can only talk about mm-hmm. it so much. But when I go into it, I say, and this is another one, you know, my first interview, Kate Moore, it went really well. But one of my friends did call me and say, hey, I was 30 minutes into the 40 minutes and I was about to buy the book and then you went off on a tangent. Right. And he said, you know, I forgot about the book. And it was amazing feedback because that's why I said, you know, for my guests, I'd say, we're going to have fun. We're going to sell the book, but having fun is the most important part. Mm-hmm. We decide to get off on a tangent. We're talking about our favorite Netflix shows. So be it. It's, it's my podcast. I can do what I want. <laughs> But I don't want to forget that we are there to kind of sell the book. And by sell the right. book, I mean sell that story to somebody who mm-hmm. wouldn't see it, wouldn't hear right. it. This is, oh, this is why it's so interesting. This is why this book is great. Let that author shine. And then let somebody who never would have picked up that book hear about it and maybe grab it. 100%. And that, that is 100% true. It's always good to have discussions like little fun discussions here and there in the interview but remembering you're allowing the author a platform to tell their story tell their book and present it to an audience that is probably as you said have never heard about this book in their life or they've been researching this topic for a long time they're like i need a book that's really gonna help find it oh wait a minute this book's already out by this author okay and all of that work, as we said in the beginning, it's a long process and very lonely hours going into editing, fine tuning, making sure there's no errors whatsoever, which leads into like the final question of the business side before we get into the last part. And this is like a very long one. So I'm going to give context for this one. So I had a guest a while back and she was talking about uh, books and it still applies to like anyone uh, like 
content creators, podcasters, and so forth. And she said, the biggest lie you can ever believe is that if you're an indie author or content creator or so forth, the biggest lie you can ever believe is that your debut novel is going to be your ep your episode or book that's going to make your name known to the masses. Now, there's a 50-50 chance that could work. Your debut novel or your starting episode for your podcast could probably get the numbers you're looking for. But on the other side, it's not the chance. And that could easily deflate a person. And that, again, bring up the imposter syndrome of, am I actually doing this? Why, why am I doing this if no one's really listening to it? So, Brent, in your opinion, how important is it to realize that there is that chance you probably may not get the numbers you're expecting as a content creator, but you should never be deterred in producing something that you love. And adding on to that, for you personally, what has continued to discipline you to make your content, your why in essence? I do love this. I mean, you had said it, you know, it's something that you love and when I started doing this, everybody would love to be Joe Rogan. We'd love to be getting Joe Rogan numbers and let this be our job. Uh, but it's it's probably not going to happen. Like the numbers just say that it's probably not going to happen. And it, it's, I think, a lot like being an actor or something like that, where mm -hmm. you could do it perfectly, but you also need some luck. And right. You need to pop in some places and you just may not have it. The thing that keeps me going is I love this stuff and I love interacting with people. Uh, and I think something that helps too, and it's, I guess it's a little bit ego driven. Uh, this is mine. My, my best friend and I, we own this. We do what we want. There's nobody else telling us that, hey, you can do this or you can't do this. We decide. Um, we, we've had some authors on where, you know, there's some, there's a few places where they probably wouldn't be allowed on just because of the way some people think about things. And our answer is, we love the book. We're, we're going to have the author on. We're going to do that. I, I think it's, you know, less discipline and just more. I, I love it. I, as I said, I, I read that book and I'm like, n selfishly, I want to talk to the author, too. Right. <laughs> if there was nobody else going to listen, I might be like, well, I, I get to have a cool conversation. So why not? Uh, it, it is that harder part. And you know all about it. It's all of the other stuff beyond that messaging and, and keeping up on comments and posting and all of that stuff. That's where, you know, my love for reading these books and talking to these authors gets me through when I'm sitting there typing that fifth social media post. And you're just like, I just wish I could skip this week. But it's also so important for me. And I guess this is just kind of my former military brain. If I say I'm going to put something out every Wednesday, I got to put it out every Wednesday rain or shine, no matter what, I have to keep to my schedule. Just because I think there is that thing in the back of your head where if I miss it once, maybe I'm going to miss it again. And I'm going to miss right. it again. And then I, everything just snowballs. Or maybe I'm just OCD. I don't know. Do you, do you run into the same thing? Definitely. 100%. And I like asking this question because originally um, I usually say what motivates people, but a guest of mine actually challenged me to say, it's not so much as motivation, it's discipline. Because you could be motivated to do something, but it may not be your best work. Or as I think he said, it will not be your best work because you're just simply motivated. If you're disciplined, it's because you love doing this. You want to keep doing this. No one's going to do it better than you. Same thing as writing a book. If you have an idea for a book, you know that idea better than anyone else. You alone can set the schedule, set the pace. And if you're consistent, it's going to show. And same thing with podcasting. If you know that these are the episodes that I like to produce, these are the guests I love to have. And just having that schedule, it keeps you focused and it keeps you on track. Granted, life sometimes gets in the way and we it's out of our control. But as long as you have something that keeps you disciplined, then you will definitely be fine. And you will definitely see a greater show of what's the word I'm thinking of authenticity than simply being motivated. Cause 
you can be motivated maybe a few times in your life, but if you're disciplined and you're centered and focused, you'll be the best version of yourself than you ever were before. Absolutely. And it's just, it's fun. I'm having fun. So all that other stuff that comes with it, you know, that's just kind of paying the piper so that I can continue to have fun. And also I'm not afraid to say once I stop having fun, I'm just going to stop right because it goes back to it's mine i, I right. can do what i want so it, it's a great feeling knowing that i'm doing this because i'm still having fun as long as i'm still having fun i keep going and then if one day i say you know what i don't want to do this anymore i don't have to i still have to go to work the next day unfortunately but what are you going to do right definitely and we're now reaching like the last few questions before the final question of the interview so this is going to be a two-parter so the first part is so brendan looking back at all the episodes that you created as well as your blog all the authors you've interviewed all the books you've read all the hours spent have you ever thought to yourself how different would my life be if i didn't do this and looking at to where you are right now who would you say are your biggest supporters who have encouraged you to keep going forward with your passion? Well, I'm, my biggest supporter uh, is definitely my fiance. She listens to everything. I'll have her double check my stuff. Um, I'm a terrible editor. Everything is going to be written wrong before that. <laughs> um, my daughter, she's only nine, um, but she's a huge supporter. We have um, her and Mike's daughters in the beginning of the podcast. We have them say hello, nerds. So they're in the podcast. Nice. Um, my, my family overall, my brothers, you know, just very supportive. Um, I'm not sure they listen to every episode, but they say they, do. <laughs> um, but uh, they're, they're the big motivators and it, it helps to know, I mean, cause kind of back to the, the first part of the question is this does fulfill something for me. It, it's something, you know, completely creative. And I think if you're one of the, you know, creative type person, you have to have something. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I have a wonderful job. I love my job. I love my coworkers and everything. But it's it, it's a job, right? It, it does this thing. You do your work. You work very hard. But for this, this just kind of scratches a completely different itch for me. Mm -hmm. That creative side and getting really passionate about something, which I am about history. Uh, so that's that that's a huge part of it is that there is that creative aspect where I'm not writing the book, but I do get that feeling when I am talking to people that they feel like they're getting something out of it, which, right. which is huge for me. 100%. And now coming to the second to last question, I think you probably already answered this before, um, which is, have you ever gotten a sense of validation from your peers? And I think you've already name drop uh, two of them, but are there any other uh, historians, uh, history podcasters, they would also like uh, to mention who have reached out to you saying, hey, I love this episode. Oh, thank you for talking to this guest. She's been like my favorite or he's been my favorite author. Is there anyone else you would like to uh, shout out? I, there was just a few authors who would get on and say, oh, I'm a fan of yours. Like I've listened. The most recent one uh, was Eric Blem. Um, just wrote a great book called The Darkest White about uh, you know, one of the pioneering snowboarders in American history. Right. And we got on and he said, dude, I've been listening to you all day. He goes like, you, we haven't talked yet. You have a new fan. And that was just, I, I could live on that for a year. Uh, it, it's just so cool that somebody who is doing something that I find extremely difficult and stressful he's coming on to talk about his book but he kind of took the time to just sit there and listen um, another one was rob harvilla who uh, does a podcast for the ringer um for any right. sports fans out there uh, he did 60 songs that explains the 90s and was able to snag him because i'm a 90s kid and it just hit me same perfect. here <laughs> <laughs> and got on it was one of the coolest conversations ever and this is a guy who i'm I'm sure his downloads completely dwarf mine. I mean, just not even. And we got on and he was so grateful and, you know, just like, this is so cool what you're doing. And I 
I'm so honored to be here. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea, right? Like I, it, it was just the coolest thing. And I think it does give you just a little bit of validation. Just anybody that you don't know that in family that doesn't already love you and has to say the nice things. Right. Every time it happens and you're just like, this is super cool. Awesome. And now we've come to the final question. It was probably the most important one. So, Rendon, looking back at everything up to your life at this moment and with all the knowledge you've gained from the guests you've interviewed to fellow history podcasters who have showed you the ropes, who have provided you tips and tricks and resources to use, what is your word of wisdom to fellow history enthusiasts who want to take their passion and turn it into a podcast, a blog, or anything that has to do with history? Make sure you're having fun. Whatever it is you're doing, make sure you're having fun with it. If you're really passionate about something, and I mean, there is a version of the podcast that I wouldn't want to do. And that was something where it's like, well, maybe more people will listen if I do this. And what I always come back to is I don't want to do that. That doesn't seem fun to me, right? Like somebody else may do that and have fun. I wouldn't have fun doing that. I, that's the most important thing is if you love this and you're going to have fun, I'm doing it for free. <laughs> so that's right. the proof right there. Um, I, I do think a lot of people will start to do things and then you kind of see they start to change things because they might get a few more followers or they think they're going to get a few more clicks. And if, if clicks is what you want, and I admit to being a number watcher myself at times, mm -hmm. you always kind of go back to, if you're getting more clicks sooner or later, that's not going to be enough. But if you love what you're doing, you'll just keep doing it and not even think about it. 100% agree. And this concludes another historian's interview on the channel. I want to thank our guest, Brennan, for joining us today. Brennan, thank you so much for being on the show. And where can people find and engage with you on social media and find your uh, podcast? And apologies, listeners, if I move out of frame, I have to get my wire for my phone. It's almost dead. <laughs> I'll take it from here, Gabriel. Uh, HistoryNerdsUnited.com, that's the blog. And then if you're on any social media, just search History Nerds United. We should be the first one popping up there. If not, do send me an email because I'm probably doing something wrong. All righty. Perfect. Perfect. And are there any upcoming episodes that you would like to highlight? Oh, next week is uh, Bettany Hughes, who, if you've ever been on the History Channel, you've seen her. She has been putting out history that I absolutely love for years. Uh, this week was Hampton Sides, one of my favorite of all time. And then I just actually booked um, Adam Higginbotham, who put out Midnight in Chernobyl was his last book, and his new book, Challenger, will be out soon. And I just can't be more excited. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm freaking out. Awesome. I will link those down all below in the description of this video. Make sure to follow Brendan. Make sure to blow up his channel, everything. As historians, we all want to help one another, and I've always said that before. Being historians, it is a very small community, but it's a community with everyone from different backgrounds in the pursuit of history and telling the truth and just making it fun and engaging. It's the three E's, as I like to say. Educate, entertain, and enlighten. And we have now arrived officially at the end of this interview. Again, I want to say thank you to our fellow history buff and podcaster Brennan for joining us and allowing us to see his world, his passion and things to look forward down the road. Brendan, thank you so much for being on the show. You've been an amazing guest. Thank you, Gabriel. Awesome time to have, be on here. Thank you so much. And listeners until next time, this has been the wandering scribe and the wandering quill. Make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below. And until next time, we are signing out.